The natural world impacts and influences our lives, whether you're young or old, and if you engage with it or not. Today we have one young man who's heavily involved with our natural world, and you may have seen him on Blue Peter or at the RHS flower shows. It's of course, Greenfingered George. But first, a big thank you to our sponsor, Vectorworks. Make sustainability a priority throughout the design process with a suite of tools built specifically for landscape architecture and design. Vectorworks gives you the freedom to follow your imagination wherever it may lead. With remarkably flexible software that integrates BIM for landscape and GIS workflows, sketch, model, and document in a single tool with the world's most design-centric BIM solution. Discover Vectorworks Landmark and design without limits. Visit vectorworks.net to learn more. So George, thank you so much for coming to join us today, coming all the way down this morning. Really, really appreciate it. And we've got a lovely day here at the Botanical Gardens in Birmingham, so perfect day for it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming. No problem, no, I'm really happy to be here. It's such a beautiful place, you know, it's, um, it's one of them in it, you never knew it existed, but it's so lovely. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try and have a little walk around later and have a bit of an explore of it. Yeah, no, you should, you definitely should. It's really interesting to, to see, and there's lots of nice little nooks and crannies to yeah. you know, hide away and you know, take in the, the, into the scenes, really. Um, but I wanted to start by asking you really, you know, what you're up to now, because it's a really interesting time for you. You know, you've just yeah. finished school, um, you're starting to look at what you're going to do with your career. And I thought, you know, what have you been looking at, what you're interested in, and where do you think you're going to go, going to go now? Yeah, so obviously I've just finished school. I uh, was just having a look at college yesterday, actually. So hopefully I get into my college that I want to go to, and I'm going to study geography, biology, and drama, which should obviously take me in an interesting way towards the sort of nature-y, you know, biological side of things. And then I'm not too sure whether I'm going to go to university or not, really. I'm... I'd quite like to get an apprenticeship in something mm -hmm. and work with somebody. So someone like um, Adam and Andre, Adam White, someone mm. like that. You know, really, someone who's been there and done it sort of thing, and then they can be a sort of mentor for me, I suppose, and I can see it. I don't have to study it in a classroom almost. I'd quite like to do it, really, just, yeah. just do it. Definitely, no, I think that's definitely the way to go. I mean, I've recently finished university, um, and I think, Looking back, I would definitely recommend yeah. either not university yeah. or um, an apprenticeship route. I think there's a lot better options, and especially with the cost now, I'm not yes. convinced it's really worth it. Um, yeah. You know, it's very expensive, um, and there's a lot. There's so much opportunity out there, and the professions are diversifying so much. Yeah, there's so many other things and other skills that are really valuable um, to get. But obviously, there is a it's a very difficult choice because um, you do kind of need those qualifications behind you. Um, so it's going to be interesting, really interesting to see how things kind of evolve and change going forward. Yeah. But have you thought about what kind of profession you might want to go into or do you kind of want yeah. to do a bit of everything? Um, I think I'd quite like to start in a sort of broad range of things so I can get a wider knowledge of mm -hmm. everything. But I would genuinely quite like to go into the landscaping side of things mm -hmm. and sort of working on almost the habitat of the garden, not specifying the plants or the architecture or whatever, just the landscaping in general so working with plants and the earth you know the earth yeah. itself almost to create a beautiful naturalistic garden that's that'd be my interest personally would be that side of things and um just working to create a really beautiful setting really mm -hmm. and obviously as well i'd like to encourage wildlife with that gardening um because that's another one of my passions is nature and wildlife so i'd really like to both create a beautiful garden, but also one that is useful for wildlife and helps wildlife as well. Mm. I think it's such a good opportunity for people to use, really. You know, because a lot, you know, not everyone has a garden, but a lot of people do. And if everybody can create their garden that's got a focus on nature, it's really going to help the whole ecology of the UK and the wider world. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, what's really interesting about the landscape side of things is, is scale. Yes, which is what's, yeah. what's, what's really important. And it's so much of what we need to do now is reconnect habitats and everything. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. So you kind of, are you more interested in kind of um, that larger scale or more interested in the kind of garden scale? Yeah. Have you sort of thought about that much? But there's so, there's yeah, so much crossover think, these days. Yeah. It doesn't really, doesn't really yeah. matter too much, to be honest. I, think they, yeah. I, I, think they, I do think they really link. Like you can create a really individual garden that's to your own taste. But if you've got something like a terrace, mm -hmm. all the gardens are connected. So on a wider scale, is an ecosystem you mm. might have one house that's got a pond you might have one garden that's got a lot of trees one garden that's got a lot of flowers in it one that's got a meadow one that's a bit shadier with loads of log piles you might have one that's really messy and mm. all them habitats intertwined mm. will create a habitat mm. and that's what i really like is whilst gardens are an individual like even here 
you've got your, your rockery over there, you've got the tall pine trees, you've got some flowers over there, you've got hedgerows. And individually, their own, they're their own garden, they're their own habitat, mm. but together it creates a really nice ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's really important. And it's how we get that into, yeah. you know, into the wider urban environment, especially nowadays with it becoming much more, you know, much more densely populated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting time and it's especially important for the kind of landscape professions um, to, to go in and actually start making these changes and getting yes. people engaged. And you've obviously had a huge part in that with, with yes. the RHS yes. and all this type of thing. You know, are you still, still heavily involved with the RHS? I am, yeah. So recently I went to RHS Wisley to the mm. opening of the new science centre there. And that's really because good because it's aimed at kids mm. and if you can get kids involved and you can grow that passion in children they're going to take it with them to the rest of for the rest of their lives you know they might not necessarily go for a career in horticulture but they'll carry it on so that if they have their own garden one day they'll be able to create that with in mind of wildlife mm. but um the new science center is really good because it's um looking into plants and new diseases and you know with things like you know climate change you know you are going to have new diseases you know we've seen with the covid pandemic you know this sort of thing will become more common you know i don't want to fear monger but it is you know it just yeah. is and um you know if you can get these new um places that are researching that disease you can adapt in a way to cope with climate change and obviously i want to mitigate against it and try and you know stop it as much as we can but the eventuality is if we don't we are going to have to live with climate change so you're going to need these science centers that are mm developing new understanding in disease to stop it if you know in eventuality we have a new pandemic or one that affects plants you know not necessarily one that affects us but if we've got something sorry touch my mic then didn't if we have one that affects plants <laughs> mm -hmm. that's our food source gone isn't it yeah so you know it's something that we don't think about but if we have a new disease that affects potatoes we've got no chips yeah what are we gonna do no <laughs> chippies that's you know that that's a bit that's of an apocalyptic crisis. future yeah. that isn't it we don't have yeah. a chippy so, um, you know, it's these new things that we don't think about, but we will need these new science centres that will look at diseases and things. So it's really interesting, a really good opportunity to be mm. involved in something that will be really important in our future. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's even important, you know, at the moment, we've got so many invasive species coming and yes. affecting in diseases, affecting, you know, a lot of forestry crops and all this type of thing. And tree, like, look at ash, you yeah. know, the, the impact we're going to, that makes up, I think, 30% of the UK's tree cover or something ridiculous yeah. you know it's, a, it's going to be a huge impact on our landscapes and ecology and a lot of it's preventable you know yeah and um or at least we need to understand it better and as you say you know food crops and things it's going to be it's going to be vital yeah and the more people that understand that and value that the more chance there is to protect it and you know stop Definitely. these things going forward and also people take things into their own hands you know you see people gardening more and you know with covid people have are starting to value yeah. green spaces around them and discover places that they've not been to before that's on their doorstep um, because often we think about, you know, you think of the environment, you want to go for a walk, you go, you know, from Birmingham to the Peak yeah, District or you yeah. go to the beach or whatever, whereas actually there's so many gems yeah, nearby that people absolutely. just aren't aware of. No, I, I totally agree with that. And if we can create more smaller green spaces, we don't have to, you know, you've got the, like you're saying, the big habitats, you know, Scottish Islands, Lake District, Derbyshire, Wales, you know, um, Hampshire, New Forest. But if you can create these smaller habitats mm -hmm. together, they will create, you know, one massive sort of, intertwined mosaic if you like yeah of natural habitats you know it doesn't have to be big you know if it's just a little sort of where a house was mm -hmm. that's a little habitat and if you've got one down the road as well it's all these little pockets that nature can move through and gardens are really good for that as well for things mm -hmm. moving about you know you hear a lot about hedgehogs and things that gardens are really good for them it's a safe natural corridor for them to use so we can create these little little nature reserves it creates that nat nat natural corridor for things to move about and to be able to survive. Two, and it, you know, if it's things that require a bigger habitat, they can move to the bigger habitats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it means things can expand their range, and yeah. you know, it helps mitigate things like flooding and stuff as well. You know, all, all those tiny little things really add up when you look at look at the big scale. And urban environments are so diverse and so. Yes interesting because there's no real one solution you know there's so many opportunities to do your own thing come up with your own style you know it's a really very dynamic yes and a lot of the new buildings we're seeing going up you know lots of green roofs in london and well, all over the uk now um, lots of terraces that are all yes. planted you know it's becoming much more the norm and it's gonna you know in a few years it'll be totally transformed the, the urban Definitely. environment is very much becoming the norm which is a very important time for yeah. all of us 
Um, but also it's on everyone's radar, you know, climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, you know, it's, um, we've got to act now. We've got Absolutely. To act Absolutely. So, you know, you know, and you've obviously been doing a lot in the garden with COVID, but yes. it's all stuck at yeah. home. You know, so what have you been up to in your garden? Um, so we've been working on the ponds. So that's one of our new things is that we've connected two ponds together, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, it's a bigger pond. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, science, yeah. <laughs> but um, this new pond, which is quite, what's quite good about it, is that it's a lot deeper than the other bits, which is mm. good for things like frogs, mm. because it both stays, stays cool in the summer and then also stays warmer in the winter because it's a bigger body of water. So that's really useful. And then what other stuff I've been doing? So I've been working in my grandma's garden at the moment as well, and I've just sort of landscaped a rockery area, which has been quite interesting. I've quite enjoyed doing that. And I'm going to adjust it a little bit, add a bit more grit and things. Mm -hmm. um, now I've been up to quite a bit, um, mainly um, bringing on the seedlings as well. So our smart plants have just sort of gone to the next stage now where they're just getting flowers on them, mm -hmm. which is really good. We're going to stake the cucumbers at the moment. Um, and I've been up to quite a bit, really, and you know, and enjoying it as well because you know, that's the thing with you know, with the garden, you've got to enjoy the garden as well, you know, especially at the moment when the weather's a bit nicer. Just get out and just just enjoy it and just sit in the sun and admire it, admire the work you've done, and through that you can then see what areas you want to adjust and change. So we're probably going to take out some of the iris that have died died back a little bit and replace them, and work on the new pond start planting that out with some native pond plants, which will be really nice. Um, and yeah, and just enjoying it as well. Yeah, definitely. No, it's really important. Yeah, and people definitely. can see a lot of this stuff and follow you on, on what yes. you're up to on Twitter and on your YouTube channel and things and see what's going on. Definitely. So it's really interesting. That's how I knew about the pond. Yeah. Very, yeah, really nice to see. Um, and your little <laughs> frog blog. The frog blog, yeah. yeah. That's good, that's good. Do you grow primarily, is, is your garden primarily for, for habitat or do you grow a lot of your own fruit and vegetables and things as well? Yeah, so I'm personally more interested in the ornamental side of things, but um, we do grow a lot of our own veg, so we're not totally self-sufficient, but we've got um, taters in at the moment, uh, I don't think we've, got any, we've got some leeks growing, just planted out some purple sprite and broccoli, uh, got a couple of apple trees, which have done really well this year, actually, we've got quite a few coming on that. Uh, onions, uh, schlots, garlic, so we do grow quite a few, and then herbs, mm. things like that. Um, so it is, it's just so satisfying when you do grow something yourself and you can take it back and eat it because you know that you've nurtured this plant, watched it grow, and now you're eating it. Mm. It's a really, really great feeling. And obviously it's good for the environment as well because that food isn't travelling and then coming back to your house. It's just straight from the house, straight from the garden into your house. Yeah, there's much more appreciation for it as well. Yes. And it always tastes better as well, I find. Oh, definitely. If you it yourself. Definitely. You know? And then it always make it to the house though. You always end up eating something yeah, on the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. We used, to, we used to grow a lot of um, stuff at home, but where I live at the moment here in Birmingham, we don't have a very big garden. Yeah. And we're renting, so we kind of can't do a, lot, a, a great deal really. Um, and our garden's very, very small. So yes. now we've got baby on the way, so we need it to be yeah, as, safe, as safe as possible. Proof. Yeah, that's it, baby proof. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I, I wanted to find out as well a bit more, well, you said you liked ornamental, the ornamental yes. side of things. What type of, is there a specific specific type of ornamental gardens you sort of prefer or designs you kind of mm. are drawn to? Does your garden have yeah. a bit of a theme or? Yeah, I like a naturalistic theme. So for example, uh, do you know the designer, Mr. Shihara? I can't say I do. Okay, he designs Japanese gardens. Mm. Um, he, he's quite a lot, he uh, does a lot at Chelsea. And his gardens are incredible because he, he, you know, he, I always think he looks like the slice of a mountain. And it's in a very, very small area because it's the artisan garden. So it's, you know, it's not much bigger than, than this bandstand. But it's such an incredible thing that he does because it looks so natural. It doesn't mm. look like a man has touched it. It's unbelievable. It's they're just so stunning. And I love those sort of gardens where it doesn't look like a garden. It looks like a natural habitat. Mm. So our garden is on a hill. So it goes up in levels. Uh, so what my dad's done is he's... Um, cut out these levels and sections to make it flatter in certain areas. And I love the way that's done, where you've got a gradient and it's split into sections, but you create it so it kind of flows. So like the rockery at RHS Wisley, the way that comes down in stages and you can see the actual garden itself seems to progress as it comes down. You've got the slightly boggier areas at the bottom, then the rockery, and then, you know, maybe like a more of a Japanese theme at the top. It's just incredible how the garden itself, yes, yeah, seems to progress, 
I just think that's such an amazing thing to be able to achieve and to get it to that stage where it looks so natural and so perfect. But, you know, there's still a bit of imperfection there to make it look natural. I think that's just an incredible, just an incredible thing to be able to do. Yeah, indeed. And a lot of, um, I've met a lot of landscape architects who sort of say, you know, some of the best landscape designs you would never know have, yes. have been designed, you know. And, you know, that's a really, it's a really good point. There's a park near here um, called Worley Woods. Um, which is right near where I live. It's a really nice, beautiful yeah. park. It's very, very well landscaped, and it's got those vistas and things. And yes, really, actually, yeah. you should go and have a look, or we can go and have a take you guys for a walk around there later if you're around. Um, it's a really nice spot, not not far from here. Um, I think it's one of the Green Flag top ten parks oh, right. in the UK. So really nice spot. But also, it's interesting because um, that seems to be very much the way the flower shows are going. Yeah. I mean, I've not been to too many flower shows. I've only been to a handful. Normally when Adam's inviting me yeah, to come along yeah. and see what he's been up to. Um, but it seems to me very much that even over just the last few years, it's really shifted into more sort of naturalistic yes. um, landscape style design opposed to the typical more urban garden yeah. designs it used to be. But have you sort of noticed the same thing? Or Yeah, I do. I, I get what you mean, actually. Yeah, I've noticed, you know, um, at Chelsea that things are starting to sort of progress from too sort of architectural. There's still that sort of architectural theme of, you know, lots of square flags and things like that. But it has kind of changed and progressed a little bit too more naturalistic yeah. gardens. I get what you it's mean there. It's a bit softer. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, soft, more softer curves designs. And, and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks more, more imperfect, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I called the wrong the... word that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> looks in, looks <laughs> you know imperfect, yeah. 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 But, but no, but I think it's, it's good to have it like that because Definitely, it's more yeah. human in a way. Yes. Even though it's less yeah, yeah. regimented, like you quite often attribute to um, design yeah. things, it kind of has that more yeah naturalistic feel. It's softer. Um, and I think quite often they're more inviting or more peaceful I as well. I think so. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, it's good to see, you know, and also it, a lot of them are having much more of a focus on biodiversity and things too, yes. which is which is really important. Yeah, that theme is starting to get out there a bit more now, and people and people's mindsets I think are starting to change now. You see it a lot more on Gardeners World, all of your garden, where people are wanting more you know gardens that are better for wildlife mm. because that mindset now is starting to change where people are starting to have a more familiarity with nature and are starting to understand it a bit more mm. and i think that's a really really good thing for people to have it's Definitely, just having yeah. it in the back of the minds to create something that's great for nature and think people you know you, you know you're having you're having a baby and it's great for parents to be able to show kids that nature whether it's you know if you have a very small pond You've got a tadpole and it's such a great thing for kids to watch. You know, you're watching them little tadpoles progress into frogs and it sparks that um, connection with nature in children. And I think that's such a fantastic thing for kids to be able to do. Definitely. And I think as well, it's, it's, it's been important for people to see that it, it doesn't have to be this kind of wild, unkept yeah. space. It can actually be beautiful as well, which is often what, not what people attribute to it. Yes. So that's really important to see. And that's why the flower shows are so powerful in promoting that kind of view of how things could be and how they could look whilst also having all these other amazing benefits yes. as well. Yeah, I think that is a, like a misconception with wildlife gardens that they have to be completely and utterly unkept. Yeah. All brambles everywhere, totally almost derelict. Mm. But no, you can create a nice and neat garden that still benefits nature. If you have a little bit of a scruffy area in the corner that nobody's going to see, that's, you know, fair enough. But it's having it it's getting that balance between having something that is totally ornamental and then having something that's good for nature as well. That's it. And how have you found working in your garden with the family? Have they let you sort of have free reign? Have you been involved in a lot of the design of it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, mm. my dad's kind of rules the roost a bit in the garden, mm. but uh, that's what I quite like about doing my grandma's garden is have a bit more free reign. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I am involved in the design as well. Mm. And it's, um, you know, it is nice to be able to have a garden because yeah you can do what you want in it and it's your space your canvas to do whatever the hell you want to do with it yeah and that's a really nice bit of independence really like um i have like little sections of the garden that i kind of claim <laughs> um but you know overall the garden is obviously shared you know between mm. the family but um it's a really nice you know to be able to have your little areas that you kind of um control and uh, do what you want with i say no we were the same i remember um, when I was at home with my parents, we um, probably about the same age. Yeah. We um, we just moved into a new house and we needed a, we wanted a pond, mm. so we decided to get all my mates around and have like a barbecue yeah. and like dig this great big pond. 
Um, and then we sort of, you know, divvied up some of the garden for vegetables yeah. and then we got chickens. Like everyone got really nice stuff when they finished school, yes. like holidays and money. And I got given chickens. So that was my, <laughs> that was my GCSE present. Um, <laughs> You know, so a bit different to, to what you'd normally see. But it's amazing how even introducing something like chickens to the garden, you can kind of keep them penned up in a small yeah. area. They don't need a, a huge amount of space, but we let them kind of free roam. And it's amazing how that changes the whole dynamic yes. of the space. And it's also really interesting of how people kind of interact with it. Because when before we had them, people would sort of come around and sit on the patio, yeah. um, you know, by the pond and sort of you just stay there. But then as soon as the chickens came in, yeah. people would want to see them and they kind of yeah. go exploring through the garden more to find them. and. You know, introducing animals is such a it huge, is. adds a huge amount of value. You know, it's not Get just the mean, eggs. Yeah. It's, you know, they become, they really do become pets yeah, and things. And, friends. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. Yeah. My mum has been working at home during COVID and she's, um, you know, everyone's been a bit down, haven't they? Yeah. And um, she started feeling a bit down and um, one of the chickens came and started sitting in the house with her at almost exactly <laughs> the same time. And now we have basically have a house chicken that comes and sits in the house and it just sits next to her all day while she's working in the uh -oh. sort of her office um, by, the, by the back door, you know. Um, and we don't have a particularly big garden. You no, know, we don't no, have a big garden. No. You can get them in quite small spaces. Um, and there's just so much you can do to, yeah. you know, to sort of enliven the space. And, you know, chickens, for example, are such a wonderful yes. pet. You know, they used to come and peck the back door and all that type of thing. So I really encourage people to, to get, get them chickens. and, and yeah. to get chickens. Yeah, get they're great chickens. pets. Great pets. Yeah, um, I've always wanted chickens, but um, I, I, the, the space isn't big enough, and also we're surrounded by main roads, uh, so we're a bit worried they'd just wander off and get killed. Clip their wings. Can you? Yeah, because yeah. we, we just live in a terrace house. Okay. So, um, well, semi-detached, I suppose, but in yeah. a long line of houses. And, yeah. um, you know, we've got a main road outside of our front door yes. and a school kind of to the back. Um, and we sort of, when we first got them, they'd fly around a bit and fly yeah. on top of the fence. But then they got into the next door's garden where they had some dogs and um, they kind of realized, oh, it's dangerous outside yeah. this garden. And after that, they just stayed there. <laughs> so, you know, you might lose one or two. We didn't lose any, luckily. Oh, um, yeah. But we did start clipping their wings as well. And they kind okay. of, it makes it very awkward for them to fly. Yeah. It's just like cutting your nails. It doesn't yeah. hurt them. Oh, yeah. Um, and they're just sort of a bit off balance and then they can't quite fly up as high as they would do. Um, and then, okay. yeah, they just sort of stay in the garden and they're mm. perfectly happy. So yeah. the only problem is they do trash everything. Yeah, so and poo everywhere. You yeah. need to, and poo everywhere, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially when they're a house chicken. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, but they are a really great, great pet. And, um, you know, they just bring a lot of life to yeah. the space. So. And I do, I like chickens. I do really like chickens. And um, it would be great to get them one day. Yeah. And also you can get really small breeds. Yeah, So we've got some like English game bantams. <laughs> yeah. And they're very, very small. Um, and they don't really trash everything in the same way. They're just kind of, they don't, they're not big enough to kind of yeah. destroy everything and to eat all the plants. So they're not as bad. Are the eggs smaller as well? Yeah, the eggs are smaller, oh, yeah. But they're still, they're still fine though. Yeah, so you know, yeah, they're yeah. just a bit smaller. You know, bit you just have a two or three instead of Yeah, two. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But no, it's good. Yeah, chicken's a great pet. Um, yeah, I suppose it is one of them themes of the, uh, the garden that you don't really think about as the animals that you have in it. Mm. Obviously, sometimes you've got to watch it, you know, things like fish. Because if you want a pond that's dedicated to wildlife, you should probably, it isn't recommended that you get fish because mm. they eat everything. But, you know, you could have, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you had the room, you could have a fish pond and have a wildlife pond. Mm. And it is, it is such a nice thing to have animals in a garden. I, you know, I really like it. And, um, you know, I've got a dog and he, you know, wanders about in it. And then, mm. um, but the wildlife as well, that's, you know, almost like having a pet, you know, when you sit, yeah, you, know, yeah, you know, there's a pair of collared doves that live nearby. And we kind of know them and they know us. So yeah. you think, oh, hello, you know, you're yeah. back again. And he wants to wander about and drinks from the pond, goes to the bird feed and then flies off. And, it, you know, you, you get to know them. You do. And you see how different species act as well. So quite often, you know, my grandparents, they have a robin that follows them around everywhere yeah. because they know there'll be worms. And it comes and sits right next to them or by their feet sometimes, you know, while they're digging or whatever. Um, and it's really sweet. And it becomes, you know, especially as people get older, it becomes really important. Yeah. And this is one of the things we've been talking about in, in my practice with care homes and things, it's not just about, you often think about the people, but you need to think of the wildlife yeah. as well and the relationship between the two. Because if people are less able, it becomes a huge part of their day and part yeah. of their life is seeing wildlife and things moving around the spaces around them. Mm. You know, it's really, really important for people to see that. Definitely. It does really help, you know, like in my grandma's garden, there was a robin that knocked about for a bit. I mean, you know, my grandma was so chuffed every time, yeah. you know, and she put little nuts out and That's it. try and encourage them in. And you know, it was so lovely. Mm -hmm for her and it was so lovely for the robin as well because it's a nice habitat for him to knock about him exactly exactly 
And how did you get involved with all of this to begin with? So did you have you always yeah. been involved in gardening from a very young age? Yeah, or? yeah. So um, I suppose my dad is attributed to that. So um, he did the garden whilst whilst I was very, very young. And I've been involved in that. You know, maybe not, you know, when I was very young, obviously I wasn't involved in the landscape inside of it. <coughs> But I was involved with the, you know, planting the veg, you know, doing the peas and soil roll holders, things like that. And yeah. then um, my mum does uh, like fe festivals and runs a charity that's devoted to helping people cook and garden. And then my gardening teacher at primary school was really influential in that because she, you know, got us involved in a very young age and she was always crazy and, <laughs> you know, exciting and, you know, really engaging, mm. I'd say. That's really important. Yeah, it's important to get engaged at a young age and just Definitely. keep your eye on with it. Um, yeah. So how? So you're obviously looking now at you know going to college yeah. and all this type of thing, and you've sort of selected your subjects. Have you looked at any? I'll just be interested to know yeah, this. Yeah. Have you looked at any kind of education campaigns from any of the organisations? Because obviously I'm in, yeah. in them, so yeah. I don't I don't <laughs> see it from the outside. Um, no. That's <laughs> 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 uh, honest, aren't they? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very, yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's interesting because, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I finished school. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm, you're 16, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm 28, so a bit older. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I remember that we never really saw anything when I was at school. Yeah. It all kind of came after. Yeah. After I left, really, that I really yeah. found out about what there was. Yeah, yeah I haven't seen too much yeah, that there's... I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, because Adam was asking if you'd seen the um, Choose Landscape campaign. Uh, no. Which is, yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we, we have shirts, so he yeah. said um, we'll, we'll get you a shirt. Um, so you've got that to look forward to. No, I'm very excited now. I've uh, made me 21 that. That's yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Made me 20, 21. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing I wanted to ask about as well, really, was um, climate crisis. So yes. we talked a lot about the climate crisis already and, and biodiversity and that type of thing. But You've been quite vocal in, in getting engaged with that. Yeah. Um, have yeah. you been involved with any of the other groups like um, Fridays for Future and all that type of thing? I have, yes. So, um, I, you know, obviously not not recently because of mm. the, the pandemic, but b just before the pandemic, I was involved in that. I went to quite a few protests mm -hmm. in Manchester, which was really, you know, it's, it's really, really exciting. You know, I remember the first one I went to, there was only about 20 of us there at first, and then all the um, university students came around the corner Mm. And you proper felt like you were involved in something. Yeah. And yet, you, you know, you proper like sort of Sex Pistols, The Clash, you know, <laughs> come on, you know, <laughs> running through the streets, mm. like, you know, yeah. shaking your banners at people and things. It's so, um, oh, it's just so, it's just such an amazing thing, really. It's, um, you feel very empowered yeah. to do something. You really feel like you're doing something great. And it's a shame recently because, you know, we haven't, haven't been involved in it just because, you know, the pandemic and it's, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to be careful. But it's such an amazing thing to be involved in. Hopefully when it does come back, we'll be able to go to a few more protests. But um, I really would recommend it to anyone who is who wants to be involved, do it. It's mm -hmm. just so exciting and you, you do make a difference. You, people do notice you and you do find that people listen. Definitely, and um, you know, not necessarily protesting, but online doing petitions and just being vocal about it, and even just talking to people about it, your mates about it. You don't need to ram it down the throats or anything, but just mm. just mention it every now and then, and just try and just try and just keep it out there and keep it floating about, and then eventually because people it's start in, to change yeah. change their views, and it already. Even I've noticed, you know, in my, in my many 16 years of being <laughs> on this planet, I've noticed there's been a shift yeah. in people's opinions. Like when I was very young, you'd hear it floating about a little bit, but it wasn't, uh, you know, as sort of spoken about. But now it's really hammering it and, you know, people are really starting to to get passionate about it. And I think that's such a such a hopeful thing to have because you hear a lot of doom and gloom and world's going to end and there's you know glaciers melting you know the, the stuff in america with the heat wave mm. it does feel like it's the end of the world and i i do i want to emphasize how important it is you know mm. i've noticed myself with the moors so yeah like for example the moors like over lockdown i walked up there every single day and i managed to explore quite a big area because you know the moors are very very vast and, you know, I, I kind of felt like, you know, it was almost my home a bit. You know, every time mm. I'd go up there, I'd, you know, in the winter, there's not much wildlife up there, I have to admit. You know, it's the grouse and the mountain airs, but that's 
about it really you know you're looking to see anything else really and the weather's awful as well but um, I really you know felt comfortable there and I knew every every rock and creature and all that yeah. and every tree and every path and all that and then to come back and see it burning it's like you know you feel so disheartened mm. because there's nothing that you can do you know you just sat there staring like that's it, you know, that's yeah. it, it's over, and, you know, the next time I go up there, it's completely burnt to a crisp, and there's nothing left, and mm -hmm. it's like, it's just so disappointing. So the other thing about the moors is, obviously, the peat, and, you know, that makes up moorland. The only reason moorland is there is because of the peat, and I suppose the issue with the peat is that it is technically a fossil fuel, because it's decomposing stuff that makes it so nutrient-rich, nutrient rich. And obviously the decomposition of that creates methane, which is why it's so flammable. But also it's all, all often used in pom compost. It's often used in compost because it's got a lot of nutrients in it. And the issue with that is, is you're breaking away the peat, you're literally destroying the habitat. It's not like a, a sort of domino effect of you do this, it'll impact this. You are literally breaking away the moorland to take the peat away. So by using peat-free compost, it, it, it does help because it just reduces the demand, which will reduce the impact. And, um, you know, it is a shame because you are breaking away the habitat and peat is so important because it's fundamental to everything that survives on moorland. And there's lots of plants that are up there that you don't really find anywhere else, like sundews. They're, you know, a little tiny carnivorous plant, but you don't really get it anywhere else up than either up on moorland. And heather, it's a, quite a rare species nowadays. Cotton grass, they, you know, it's another moorland specialist, but also sphagnum moss, which is really, really important as regards to flooding and water management because it soaks up that water then releases it slowly so it, i think it's something called um uh lag time and so um yeah lag time you know the time it takes for the water to get into rivers but if that sphagnum moss soaks it up it won't immediately go into rivers which will increase the you know the amount of water in the river which will cause flooding and it also erodes the peat when you get too much rain but sphagnum moss it soaks it up so there isn't as much water running over the peat to wash it away. But also when you have drought, it releases it slowly, so it keeps the moorland moist. So if you do have a fire, it won't spread as quickly because the moorland is already damp because the sphagnum moss is soaking it up. And then, this, you know, so if you are breaking away the peat, the sphagnum moss can't survive. So the moors are drier, and then when it does rain, it washes away and erodes the peat, which means you're losing the habitat, effectively. Yeah. And then it causes too much nutrient in our rivers, which has loads of knock-on effects yeah. and, you know, degrades, you know, farmland and all this type of thing as well. If there's, you know, you know, well, you're not, not that you get much farmland on moorland. No, not too much, no, because it's quite hard for the livestock to survive. Because it's quite a brutal place in winter. And then also there's not much, well, you can't feed the, you know, you've got sheep. I don't think they can eat the heather. I mean, I might be wrong, I'm not a farmer, but I, 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 I doubt it, cause it's yeah. quite woody. Yeah. But, you know, ideally you'd want grass and you can't really grow grass on Holland. So, yeah, it's quite hard for agriculture up there, yeah. It is, and I mean, it, people don't realise as well that we've used peat for such a long time. Yeah. It's already a very degraded environment. Um, and, you know, because people used to cut it and burn it, in some places they yeah. still do. They used to cut it like logs and you can use it for, for fires yeah. and we'd use it inside to cook over because it burns quite slowly. Um, I never really thought of it as a fossil fuel though, so that's a really important point yeah. to make. It's kind of a, a, a young fossil fuel. Yeah. It's that breaking down of nutrients that releases the energy. So it's like coal, but a few year, a few million years younger. You know, it's that broken down stuff, organic matter. So that'll eventually through pressure and heat will form into coal. So you know, it's, it is an interesting perspective. Uh, an interesting way of looking at it, I suppose, yeah. It is, and it's, it's quite shocking when you realise how much is already lost, because again, it's one of these things you don't see. You might see it if they're immediately where they're cutting it, but yeah. this erosion over time is quite significant. I was talking, because my granddad's originally from, um, oh God, where's he from? Somewhere up near the moors, um, anyway. And um, he, he gave me a, a book, which is quite old, you know, black and white pictures, back from, I think probably the, well, anyway, a long way back. And there's a picture there of these two guys stood on some moorland where they yeah. knocked in a post yeah. to measure the depth of the peat. And that post they knocked in is now two metres above the ground. So they've lost over two metres of soil. And that was yeah. like 60 years ago. So you think how much had already been lost. And now that's still carrying on. It's quite, quite amazing, really, and, and, and depressing. 
I think the issue is it's like if you deforest an area, the trees are going to grow back. Yeah. But once that peat's gone, it's gone. It takes millions of years to come back. Yeah. So you're not going to, well, it's not going to come back. You're not going to. Exactly. Well, it's, it's the same problem with um, the rainforests, really, isn't it? You know, the rainforests have this problem where actually the soils are not that rich. They're not yeah. very deep. They become eroded very easily. And then you end up with this situation where it's very difficult for things to regenerate. Yeah. I've noticed it myself that over the, the last few years, they're burning a lot more regularly. Mm -hmm. Like when I was younger, it was quite unusual for the most to be burning. But now you expect it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm surprised I haven't burned yet this month, really. Oh, we're only for 2nd of July in it, but <laughs> last month, they yeah, haven't burned. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, you just come to expect, and whenever you have a heat wave, you're just hoping for the rain. Yeah. You just know they're going to, just a, they're so flammable. <laughs> and you just, uh, it's so infuriating when people do it on purpose as well. It's just no, well, I just don't say a reason why you would do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I don't get much enjoyment from it. Yeah. You know, if it's an accident, well, I was say if it's an accident, it's an accident. But yeah, you have to be pretty thick to bring a barbecue up onto the moors. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just encourage people not to be thick <laughs> and just try and use the brains and maybe not bring a barbecue up onto the moors. That's it. But uh, it's just so hard. And again, with climate change, the heat waves are becoming longer and more intense. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the misconception with climate change, it's like, oh, there's a cloud. It's climate change. It's raining. It's climate change. It's more that things are just going to become more intense. Yeah, more frequent. So that heat wave that only lasted two weeks and it was 25 degrees, it's now 35 degrees for four months. And it's, you know, it's so yeah, dangerous. I was, I was reading a bit of um, Bill Gates' new book this morning. Yeah. Have you read it? No. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so I know someone else on the podcast earlier asked me yeah. if I'd read it and I said, oh, no, I'd, I'd better read it. So I'm reading a little bit of it this morning and it was saying that one of the cities in America mm. is, is currently got, I think it's 30 hot days per year yeah. and it's estimated to go up to 160 or something like that. Yeah. Just ridiculous, you know, and this is the problem, you know, you don't see this sudden change, it's this yeah, slow it's... incremental change that's actually going to have a really devastating yeah. impact. And that's what's dangerous, I it think, is, what's is dangerous, that yeah. if people were sat there and it was like the fifth wave or Hunger Games or whatever, yeah. when it's literally meteor, <laughs> tsunami, people yeah. would be like, oh my God, but it's not like that. It's yeah. just a very, very gradual, like a silent killer it is, in yeah, a it sense is. that you don't notice it except when you think back and think, God, you know, I remember that this time last mm. year and it was only, you know, it was a bit cooler and it was a bit drier or whatever, but mm. it's just gradual and eventually it will turn into the fifth wave and you, you think, God, how have we got here, mm. you know, and yet it's just been happening slowly over a period of time. You hadn't noticed it, but it does happen and that's, that's what's it. really dodgy about climate change and global warming Indeed. is that it is very dangerous but you just don't notice it happening yeah you know exactly exactly i think silent killer is the right the yeah. right way to frame it really um and we've had some, games. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely and i think it's it's in, again it is interesting because i think it's starting to slowly sort of permeate through yes to society because a lot of people i know that really didn't care you know, they yeah. were just like, if it's important, and one of my friends said this to me a while ago, you know, if it was important, the government would do something about it. It clearly can't be that important. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of go, well, you're kind of right. You know, if yeah. it is that important, they really should be doing something about it. But then they're also pretty slow to do anything, really. Well, yeah. Um, you know, and, and you <laughs> yeah. know, change does take time. Yeah. But saying that, they just really need to, do, need to pull their finger out. And they're yeah. doing some things very well at the moment, I have to say, you know. Um, but those people's minds are really changing so this yes. this person in particular will know who he is um he's a mechanic <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um he's a mechanic and now he's really sat there thinking you know he's so major as me mm. and he's you know him and another friend of mine who both you know they've both been interested in yeah. it but they've not really you know been super engaged both of them are thinking actually we really need to train in this yeah. people need to train in it people need to start doing something and now they're both looking at retraining and doing degrees in something to do with yeah. the environment and for that to get through to those people yeah it shows that there's clearly a shift in the mindset. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and I don't know if you've seen Clarkson's Farm. You know, I think that's a really, if you yeah. haven't watched it, watch it. Because yeah. one, it's funny. But yeah. two, it also gives a really good view of farming and the challenges it's facing. Yeah. But even he's talking about the impact it's having on soils. You know, and, getting, yeah. and Clarkson used to completely yeah. disregard all of it. But say if Clarkson's doing it, then we've all got hope, haven't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it is getting through to people. And, it, and I think the impacts are becoming visible. Yes. You know, especially when it comes to biodiversity. I mean, I remember um, as a kid, we had bees and stuff in the grass. Yeah. We don't really have that anymore. 
And um, I remember huge flocks of um, murmurations of starlings flying around. Yeah. They're all gone. You don't see any of them around where I'm from in the south anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's really heartbreaking. Yeah. And you are seeing some things coming through. We've got red kites. Yes. My parents have got sparrowhawk comes to the garden very oh, often. And we're in the middle yeah. of the town, you know. Um, it's not, and as I said, yeah. it's not a particularly big garden. Um, the marine structure but projects. seeing that, yeah, exactly. It's starting really to pick well, stuff yeah. up. Um, so you, people are seeing stuff come back, um, but we're also seeing, starting yeah. to realize as people talk about it, the things that are missing. Yeah. And, and when you sort of mention it to people, they go, actually, yeah, do you know what? I do remember them being those big murmurations. Yeah. And, you know, where have they gone? Um, and it's interesting how our understanding of it's changing. We had a guy called um, Ted Green and Jill Butler on um, very recently talking about the big rewilding project at NEP and yeah. a lot of the research that's been done there. And they sort of pointed out that actually, and I read the, from their advice, I read, <laughs> read their book, um, you know, that points out how a lot of ecology and the range of birds, for example, we say, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but yeah. lots of species we attribute to, say, woodland yeah actually are not woodland species that's just yeah. the last place they can hang on um and actually yeah. from these big rewilding projects and reconnecting these spaces a lot of those birds are actually coming out of those places yes. into other areas so and yeah. that's really promising because now there's more and more evidence mm. coming forward that actually we've really got to yeah. think more holistically about how we heal some of these places and mm. you actually said exactly what we said on that podcast er um, earlier yeah. you said you know we need, mo need a mosaic of habitats yes and we do it's not all Deep dense One woodland. big block of, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's this diverse range of different habitats for different species. Mm. And you know, humans have a huge role to play because through design, yeah. we can create much more diverse habitats, especially in urban areas, through the variety of plants and, and ecosystems yeah. than you would get in nature. You know, yeah. but it's about having them connected up and being, mm. species being able to move through. So it is yeah. a really interesting time. Yeah, and one, one, one species that you could, I suppose you could talk about was like, like, like a golden eagle. Mm. Like you tend to just say golden eagles are secluded to the highest mountains in the Scottish mm. Highlands. That's the only place you get them. But really, you can get them in any upland areas. Like you can get them in moorland, well, you should get them in moorland areas. But obviously due to grouse shooting, they've all been shot mm. and they won't nest there. But you know, Wales, Wales have got pretty, well, well yeah, they've got big mountains, haven't they, in Wales, and yet they're not there. Mm. Why not, you yeah. know? So it's like what you're saying, they're only secluded to the Scottish islands because it's the only place they can really survive. They mm. should be, well, they should be on my patch. Them, uh, the, them hills are pretty high up, they've got lots of crags on them. Mm. Why shouldn't they be a golden eagle? Why shouldn't they be hen harriers? Mm. But because they've been pushed to them really, really secluded areas where on, only there they can survive, really. And it's a shame because I'd, I'd love to see the day when I can walk on Saddleworth Moor and get, <laughs> fell off, <laughs> and <laughs> getting so passionate and getting to see an area. It'd be amazing. Yeah. And I really do hope that one day I'd be able to see one mm -hmm. or a golden eagle. And it would be, it would be, it'd be an amazing thing. But just because of the pressures that are on them, they've been pushed to them really, really remote areas where no one can access them. Yeah. It's a real shame, yeah. but there's, there are a lot of really interesting points. Again, it goes yeah. back to that, it's not all doom and gloom. Yes. You know, some species are being brought, bra brought back and um, you know, a lot is being done yeah. to kind of encourage this and connect things up. And people are, people are getting it, you know, look at beavers. You know, yes. Now beavers are being reintroduced, there's so much evidence to say yeah. how valuable they are. White-tailed seagulls. Yeah, they're, exactly, they're actually, yeah. There's a maximum number of white-tailed seagulls on the Isle of Mull now. They can't, technically can't have any more. Mm -hmm. They've done so well that there's too many of them really. <laughs> and they've moved into you know, the Isle of Wight and places mm. like that. It's just incredible. And again, they're bringing them out from the remote Isle of Sky. They're in, you know, Pool Harbour now, you yeah. know, it's amazing. The, the, there is, I, I do agree, there is a lot of hope. Red Kites, that's mm. an incredibly successful yeah. introduction project. Exactly. You know, so there is hope, like, like you're that's saying, it. yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we only ever saw Red Kites when we came up to sort of the Midlands on the yeah. way up. And now we get them down near Basingstoke, you know, which is where yep. I'm from originally. Um, you know, it's pretty mind blowing, really. You wouldn't have never, you know, you used to see maybe one, everyone would be like, oh my God. And now, yeah. <laughs> now they're everywhere, you know, yeah. which is great. You know, it's how it should be. Amazing. It's how it should be. And that's how people get involved, you know, that's how people yes. get engaged. They see that, oh, look at that amazing bird. Um, you know, and they find out about it, and suddenly that's a, yeah. a way into, into, you know, learning more about the natural world. Defo. Yeah. I've done. Couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. Um, and on, on that, getting people involved, have you been involved much with, getting communities engaged um, yeah. and, and with, with groups of people. Because obviously you've done a lot with the RHS. Yes. And there's the RHS yeah. Young Champion and all that type of thing. Have you done a lot with community groups and yes. that type of work? So I remember um, distinctly working with a um, school in somewhere and um, <laughs> <laughs> working at their wildlife garden. I think it was, what was the school called? 
Chelsea, Chelsea Primary School. Mm -hmm. And that was really nice working there. Um, just for a day, just but well, I went down, went up, wherever it was, mm -hmm. and um, went to see their wildlife garden. And it was really, really nice working with a you know, really nice bunch of people. And then whenever my mum does any harvest festivals, um, work there, apple pressing, things like that. And it's such a, a really nice way to get people involved. Not necessarily hammering it into, you need to plant this, this, this to have bees. Mm -hmm. It's just being in a nice area and just sort of pointing things out and explaining to people what things are. That's sort of just such a nice, chilled out way of getting people interested in wildlife. It is, yeah. And gardening. It is. The one thing, yeah, the other question is, what if people don't have gardens? I wanted to ask you, what, what can yeah. people do if they don't have gardens? Well, I, I suppose the obvious answer would be like an allotment, something mm. like that. But even if you don't have that, I suppose you could create a nice community garden. If you've got a, if you work, if you're somewhere like a flat, Sometimes they have like a perimeter. If you kind of work with the people that own the flats, try to turn that into a wildlife garden. And that'd be nice, because that'd be a nice community aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe volunteering at a local nature reserve, something like that, mm -hmm. where you can create a wildlife garden around the visitor center, something like that. One of the, one of the ways I really got involved to begin with was mm -hmm. I did lots of voluntary work for the Wildlife yeah. Trust. You know, because we didn't have access to, well, we had our own gardens. I used yeah. to go with my grandparents, used to go a lot of walking. But when I left, I left school and quit college, because um, I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't really enjoy college yeah. at all. I mean, I studied, um, going back to the education stuff, <laughs> I studied, um, what did I study? I studied geography, oh, um, cool, yeah. sport, um, fitness instructing, that type of thing. I didn't really enjoy it. So um, I thought I'm not going to, and I kind of had, I didn't enjoy school yeah. either, so I kind of had enough. So I, I quit and I um, started doing lots of voluntary work for the Wildlife Trust. And that was really, really valuable because one, you learn a lot but actually got to meet some really interesting communities yeah. of people. I met a lot of older people who were kind of going out as a bit of a social um, and, you know, to keep physically fit, yeah. really good form of exercise. We built lots of fences, worked with, had cows, all this type yeah. of stuff. Really, really lovely. Um, and I made some really good friends from it as well, from our sort of team leaders and things who I'm still in touch with now. Um, and that's what really got me engaged and kind of thinking about it as a career. Yeah. Um, but it's such a good opportunity for people to go out. And the Wildlife Trusts and the other charities are always looking for people. Yeah. Um, to go out and, and do more, so there's a huge opportunity for people to be involved Absolutely. there. Yeah. Um, but have you done much? Have you done much sort of interior gardening? Do you do much um, with like house plants and stuff like that? I'm gonna keep house plants, keep lots mm. of cacti. Um, I suppose that is a good way of supposed people to do gardening with someone like a flat is to keep house plants, and you mm. can, you know, if you get enough of them and you, you, you're good enough at it, you can create a bit of a jungle of house plants and. Mm. Um, it is really nice. I love it when people have house plants because it's um, really good for your health, really, because obviously they produce oxygen. It's, um, especially if you're somewhere like London, which is quite polluted. If you've got lots yeah. of house plants, it'll help with the air quality. But, um, yeah, I think it's a really nice opportunity for people to create something. If you've got a balcony, you can, and, you know, if it gets enough sun, you can create a nice, nice garden. Even if it gets a bit of shade, you can create a sort of, uh, you know, use plants that are a bit better at coping with shade, you know, ferns and things. But, um you know, if you have got a small space, it is harder, obviously. You know, you can't create something like this, but you can create an area mm -hmm. that is nice just to be able to sit in. You grow things like vines or honeysuckle, things like that, that have got a nice scent and grow upwards rather than kind of outwards. You know, like taller plants that maybe don't take up as big an area, so you can have a few of them. Mm -hmm. Things like that, and then house plants, um, windowsills, all them sort of things. You know, you can, you know, use... Cellar crops, they're quite good on a windowsill, um, you know, rocket, things like that. You can, and that gives you the same enjoyment because they grow a bit quicker, so you can plant them and they'll grow quicker and you get that enjoyment and that experience out of it of growing something mm. that um, you'll be able to then eat. Or if it's yeah. a very short distance to the kitchen, then... <laughs> <laughs> That's it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of, quite a lot of innovation going on as yeah. well in, uh, in terms of um, houseplants and sort of interior... Plant, I don't really, really call it house plants, but like interior landscaping. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's kind of, because um, we've been, me and my wife have been looking at some interesting stuff for when we get a house. Yeah. Because I've seen these really cool like moss bath mats. Have you seen these? I haven't actually, but I really yeah. like the sound of it. It's yeah. quite cool. It's kind of a bit off-putting as well, but it's, it's quite a cool <laughs> idea. But it's kind of like a rubber, um, almost like trough, basically. Yeah. And then you kind of plant the moss with like a tiny yeah. bit of like substrate in there. So when you go off the shower, it kind of all drips into ah. it. And it's like quite a simple way of like greening a, a space that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Yeah. I haven't tried one, I hasten to add, but really I've seen a few idea. of them and I thought, actually, that's a yeah. really good idea. And um, same with, um, there's a company, 
who I won't mention because I want to talk to them and see if they'd be interested in doing something <laughs> with us. Um, but, well, actually I will, kiss yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Biosphere. Yeah. Um, they create um, basically terrariums, but they're kind yeah. of, but they're bedside lights. Oh, so you build cute. this really cool yeah, terrarium yeah. and then it's got like a, a sort of a dimming light on it. So you yeah. can sort of switch it on, have it as like a bedside light, but it's this really cool terrarium. That's so that's a really, another really interesting idea to bring stuff in. And one of the best yeah. ones I've seen is some of these living wall structures. Yeah, I've seen them. So, yeah, yeah. Because they had one at, um, I can't remember what it was. It might have been a, an RHS event, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I was talking to them for, for a commercial project and actually they had like an interior one. Yeah. And I was thinking... That's really interesting. And it wasn't that expensive. It was still expensive, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't as expensive as I thought it'd be for like the area yeah. you get. You know, you might get a few meters of um, this living wall for inside, you know, it's a few hundred quid, but yeah. it's still not that expensive for like what you, how much you actually yeah. get. Um, so there's really interesting stuff coming around there as well, which is yeah. quite interesting. And there's a lot of projects now where it's kind of, a lot of the bigger projects are kind of around integrating the indoors yeah. and outdoors. Um, and there's, a, there's one big project we're looking at at the moment, and it's kind of like, how do you bring, we've got these, hopefully going to have these big curves in the landscape, and actually do those curves carry on yeah. straight into the building, and then they become like an interior yeah, living wall nice. inside yeah, yeah. and all that type of thing, and amphitheatres, entrances, yes. where there might be a building yeah, yeah. at the end, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah, I've seen things like um, Nepenthes, they grow in very tropical areas like Borneo, so they need a very high level of humidity. Mm -hmm. And people grow them in like bathrooms. Yeah. Because you've got the steam coming off and that sim simulates their natural environment. Mm -hmm. okay, our bathroom's quite cold, so we don't keep Nepenthes Ours in there. Too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like built out of the house, it mm. gets very cold. But if you've got a bathroom that is warm, yeah. it's a great idea because you then, you know, I, you know, you need quite a few to make you feel like you're in the jungle, but, <laughs> you know, if you have like a sauna or something, that would be the obvious thing. Yeah. And having a few Nepenthes in there, and then it makes it feel like you're in the tropics. It's exactly, like that. yeah. It's really quite cool. Well, so it, makes, it makes home a bit of an escape as well, doesn't it? Yes. You know, and it's, yeah, yeah. it's that kind of um, calming effect, especially now with people working from home, it's more and more important to have yeah. things that help you keep calm. And we know plants have a huge impact on that, but also wood does as well. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of evidence on exposed timber helping reduce stress. You know, and this goes back to, you know, Dealing with the climate crisis is not all about sacrifice. It's no. about innovation and thinking about how we design to make better environments to help people be more productive and less yeah. stressed. Um, you know, which will, have, which will help reduce stress on the NHS. And it's all about plants, natural materials, all of that type yeah. of thing to really help. You know, so it's as I was saying, it's a really interesting time to get involved with this thinking is really kind of coming forward, and there's more and more evidence coming forward yeah. to, to back it all up. So interesting time. Uh, definitely, absolutely, yeah. and. You know, I kind of wanted to ask you as well, where are your favourite places to kind of go? Is there anywhere you'd recommend for people to go and visit, any particular yeah. gardens or mm. natural environments you'd like people to go and explore? Yeah, um, so, so it's uh, like where I live, the closest sort of, well, the closest RHS garden, I think, well, actually Bridgewater, which mm -hmm. I haven't been to yet and I'm going to go to very soon, but also Chatsworth House, mm -hmm. which is really, really nice. They've got a really nice rockery there, and that is stunning because they've got, you know, bits of rock that are the size of this, you know, mm. um, proper monstrous pieces of rock that have been there, you know, since the Victorian times. And that's an incredible rockery. And then further afield, you've got like RHS Wisley, and that rockery is dreamy. Yeah. Absolutely nice stunning. Mm -hmm. But also, go to your natural habitat. Yeah. If you're in the Lake District, go to the Lake District, New Forest, Wales, um, any of them Midlands, anywhere, and just analyse what the natural habitat looks like. And then you can try and simulate that in your garden, not necessarily using native plants. If you see a tree that's growing in a really nice shape, get an ASUS if you can grow it into that sh nice shape. If you've got an interesting area of, the, of land that seems to bend or shift in a certain way, try and simulate that. It's all about taking bits from the natural world that you really like mm. and trying to put that in the garden. And I think that's such a really nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, indeed. And this is the thing, you know, there's so much variety out there. Yes. You know, as long as you're picking plants that have, you know, the, the RHS Perfect for Pollinators list is a yes, great example. definitely. Really, yeah. really good starting point to pick to pick species. And a lot of other websites have um, something similar now to, to help you, you make your choices. So there is such a huge variety to, yep. to pick. And it'll make things more interesting as well, you know. If you can get a load of, you know, non-natives or plants which have really interesting characteristics, it helps enliven the space and it's all a bit more yep. quirky more Instagrammable, you know, which yeah, is really important, yeah. you know, so yeah. it's, it's all of those things too, you know, which will help reach and engage more people. I agree, yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, and you know, um, the final thing I was going to ask you was any advice you had for anyone that wants to kind of get into yeah. the environment and why, 
younger people should get involved yeah. because not many young it's quite uncommon for young people to be really engaged yeah. with gardening and, and the environment you know Definitely. so so it can seem like quite a daunting thing i you know i understand that but i suppose it's all about doing it in stages and just trying to build up a knowledge you know the bbc is pretty good you know but it's bbc bite size bbc i play and just go and watch some nature documentaries i feel like that's the best thing to do because you are not even got to do anything just sit and stare <laughs> And that's a really good way to slowly build up your knowledge and then sort of develop into reading books, things like that. And also just opening your eyes is the best thing and just seeing everything that's around you and noticing things. That's what I've kind of, that's what I kind of try and do in the sense of I don't have to read a ton of books. It's just going out, staring at a tree and just sitting and being patient. Like the other day I was walking through some woods near me and there was this tree that's got a really, really comfortable nook. It's like perfect for sitting on. And I just sat there and within about five minutes, I'd seen a nut arch, long tail tit, woodpecker, tree creeper. And I could hear all these sounds around me and, you know, bird songs that I couldn't recognise. And it was just so beautiful. And then I could hear this tapping mm. on, a tr on this oak tree that I was sitting on. And there was a dead branch on it. There's a nut arch sitting on it, pecking at it. Mm. And it, it didn't see me, and mm. I just stared at it, and it was just so cool. Mm. I was sitting in this tree with a nut hatch, <laughs> just doing its thing, and mm. it was just so special. And it's that connection with nature which will eventually lead you to become more passionate about it and care about it more, and just think about it on a daily basis. Don't try and think of it as work, mm. as a job. Try and think of it as just as your passion and as what you want to do, and it will eventually just lead to that. No, definitely. That's a really good, really good bit yeah. of advice, yeah. I think that's a really good point to end on, actually. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for coming. No it's, problem. Um, thank you for inviting me, I've really. Yeah. No, you're very to welcome. Birmingham. Yeah, great. <laughs> that's it. Let's look around the botanical gardens. Definitely, yeah. I'm exactly. definitely going to have to have a look now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really want to see what, what it's got to offer. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And, <laughs> no um, problem. Thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Defo. Yes. Thanks for joining us. This episode has been brought to you by our sponsor, Beans Accountants. As it's important to remember, sustainability doesn't just relate to the environment. It relates to your finances as well. That's why we switched to Beans Accountants. Beans operate on a package system, so you always know where you stand. We halved our accountancy costs by moving to them, and one of our associates just reduced theirs by two thirds. With free tax advice and accountancy support, you cannot go wrong. So make sure you check out Beans Accountants in the description below. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and you may want to check out our episode with John Little, where we talk about the importance of complexity in ecosystems, and how you can even grow plants in crushed concrete. You should be able to see a link to this here, here, or in the description below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share to friends and colleagues who might be interested as well. A huge thank you to our sponsors, Vectorworks and Beans, and our incredibly kind supporters, the Birmingham Botanical Gardens and Gillian Goodson Courses, who you might be interested in checking out if you would like to learn even more about garden design and horticulture.